What is up, XRP community? It's your host, Crypto12103. Welcome back to another video. Thank you for joining me. Make sure you smash that like button on the way in. It does a lot for the channel. Thank you in advance. So we're seeing Bitcoin right now on the daily chart around 30,000. And if we pull up XRP, looking pretty similar, we would call this crab action, sideways action. One thing I want to bring your attention to is that positive for XRP, this downward supply line, if you look at the weekly chart, I believe I drew it on the weekly, maybe not. XRP has broken out of this downward supply trend, okay? And that's bullish for it because it comes back and it tests that same resistance in the past. I gotta adjust the line a bit. Comes back, tests it, and now this used to be resistance, see? Denied on the chart here, denied on the chart, denied, denied. And you know this is resistance because when it breaks through it, you see these massive green, call them green dildos, green candles. Comes back, tests it, and it keeps running. XRP's total supply has plummeted over the past 30 days. Let's see why. Partner, a lead developer on the XRP ledger, revealed that this unexpected XRP burn was due to a series of accounts being removed from the XRP ledger. Each deletion results in the burning of two XRP tokens, leading to a net decrease of the total XRP supply. Specifically, the deletions have focused on dormant accounts that once held a balance of XRP, the tune of 20 XRP tokens, the former account reserve amount. Now the you have to have 10 XRP tokens to make a wallet. So essentially, these inactive wallets the XRP was burnt. I'm not really sure how I feel about that. Notably, this revelation has sparked a renewed interest in the underlying dynamics of the XRP ledger. It underscores how operational decisions like account deletions can ripple effect on the circulating supply of the native token, potentially its influence, it's influencing its value and market dynamics. Now, speaking of XRP burning, this is what we call a supply shock in economics. How do you determine the price of anything in this world? Supply and demand. So as long as demand stays steady, and it hasn't changed, it's only going up, and supply decreases, that shifts your price up. Something that people tend to forget about the XRP ledger. And if you guys do use Twitter, uh, come on over to Twitter, give me a follow. I do believe it's in the video description below. I want to show you this great find from 801 XRP. Speaking of XRP, if you guys need an exchange or a spot to get XRP or Flare, I recommend I'll pull it sleek, it's simple, it's secure, and it's where I dollar cost average and buy my XRP and Flare daily. Take a listen. Thank you, uh, Larry. Well, Ryan, um, in the many conversations that we uh, chair about uh, this topic, um, we start from a point of finding uh, DLT interesting, uh, revolutionary. We'll come on to the other colleagues on the panel about some of the um, interesting private sector innovations there. Uh, and then we quickly run into stumbling blocks such as um, uh, fragmentation that Larry's touched on. We run into um, issues about privacy and identity, KYC, AML, and so on, uh, which the central banks are still uh, grappling with, I think. Now, tell us a little bit about the technical arguments about introducing a CBDC and overhauling the payments mechanism before we go on to look at digital assets more broadly. Um, <clears throat> sure, thank you very much for having me on this uh, panel. Um, if you don't mind, if I could just uh, put a little bit of perspective on, on some of the work that we're doing with respect to EHKD in particular, as that is sure. a, a very active development that's happening here in Hong Kong that's attracted quite a lot of uh, public attention in, in Hong Kong. Firstly, we're hugely supportive of the efforts by the government uh, and the regulators in the HKMA in Hong Kong with respect to the developments of CBDCs. We have participated in um, wholesale CBDC with Project Enbridge, demonstrated some key uh, benefits and capabilities of DLT, which I'll talk about in just a second. And now we're moving on to evaluating this, the prospect of issuing a retail CBDC in a very rich payment ecosystem that exists here in Hong Kong. And one of the most fundamental questions, the questions that keep, keeps coming up in many conversations that I'm having, and certainly that is the premise of the Rail 2 pilot program, is what does yet another digital currency uh, or digital form of payment add to, the, to an ecosystem like Hong Kong that has so many options that are very diverse? 
And then what are those capabilities that it would introduce that we don't have today? And are they actually the cost of implementing that? Is it worth what what's the, the short answer to that in your view, Boyan? So what we have developed are hypotheses that we are now uh, going to experiment with in an ecosystem that we're building at the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. So what we are doing there is we're building a uh, a real life ecosystem where we're onboarding five to 10 merchants and we're going to have 200 plus up to 2000 students transacting with the retail CBDC, doing real payments, real transactions, where we're going to demonstrate uh, three hypotheses to, to begin with, which are focused on uh, two broad areas. First area are the benefits of DLT as a, as a techno technology and capability in terms of having that uh, real-time settlement and payment rail efficiency. So the question is, can we pass on the savings that we're going to achieve uh, both from the merchant side? Can can the merchants, uh, the savings that we're going to achieve, can we lower their transaction fees? And then therefore, can they pass on some of the savings to the consumers, thus making this a more preferred mechanism of receiving payments? And the other one, which is the biggest innovation that's coming here is the use of program programmable money. So now we're going to have the use of smart contracts and automation and programmable money, ability to do things with money that we haven't previously been able to do. So we're going to apply that capability across a couple of use cases, which are actually prevalent as problems in Hong Kong. One of them is uh, a type of fraud where you have fraudulent merchants where transactions take place uh, between a consumer that sends some sort of a payment to a fraudulent merchant, but the goods never arrive. What we are going to demonstrate with program programmable money is that you can issue a payment to a merchant, but that uh, money that they've received will not be able to be used until certain terms and conditions have been met and counter signatures have taken place. Therefore, we have now eliminated or at least reduced certain type of fraud around that. The other one is we're going to look at um, harmonizing the entire reward system that exists in Hong Kong that's hugely popular, where merchants are going to be able to, in real time, issue coupons and rewards and real time discounts to consume, con consumers in an all in one wallet that they'll be able to do in real time and then monitor the use of uh, the effect that that issuance has had uh, in that particular ecosystem. Uh, and, and is that facility dependent on DLT? Could, can we have that, it without DLT? Um, so in our case, we are looking at DLT or uh, uh, blockchain uh, technology yeah. as a key enabler to making that happen. And we believe that that technology in particular, so to answer the question that you've asked, um, DLT has tremendous amount of potential uh, in terms of... Uh, it becoming a mainstream component in the banking infrastructure. Um, and I believe that the vast